Good evening. Hello. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to the last event of Skeptics in the Pub Online. The last event before QED 2022, that is. No worries, we'll be back afterwards. But QED is getting is getting closer and closer, and it messes a little bit with our schedule. But we'll get to that in a, in a, a soon. Um, yeah, who are we? We are local organizers of Skeptic in the Pubs across the UK and a few European locations. And when COVID hit two years ago, we decided we wanted to continue and started doing this thing here online. And although many of us are meeting in real life again, we continued doing it as long as people want to watch us. So here we are. I already mentioned that we're looking forward to the conference QED Question Explore Discover, which will take place in the Mercure Piccadilly Hotel in Manchester on the 29th and 30th of October. Um, normally, there's also some pre-programs starting on the 27th of October already. So um, I don't think the Manchester, the Greater Manchester Skeptics have announced uh, a Skeptics the Pub event locally yet, but I think that might be coming soon. That's not the only program on the site there. We're happy to announce that we also will be doing uh, an event called Skeptic Camp. Skeptic Camp is an event where anybody who thinks he's up to it can do a short talk, 10, 12 minutes, about a, uh, an interesting subject of his or her choice. It basically is a grassroots event where anybody can give a talk who feels up to it. It is a grassroots event, as I said. The best thing about it is it's for free. You go there, it takes a full day. We currently have 16 talks scheduled. But you need, don't need to pay a thing for it. You don't need a ticket. You just show up and listen. If you can't make it to Manchester, I've got good news. We will be streaming the event live on our Twitch channel here on the 28th of October. So in case you want to join us there, again, the start time will be 11 a.m. British summertime. Please make sure that you get your own local time, co uh, time zone right when you look it up. If you want more information and also have a look at the subjects and speakers who are announced, have a look at our website, sitp.online forward slash skepticamp. We're looking forward to meeting many of you there. Um, let me talk a little bit of our website, about our website in general, sitp.online. Um, you can get a lot of information there. You will see upcoming shows, shows that we've done, done in the past. You can find the login information for our virtual pub that we normally open after our talks. But you can also find the links to our podcast where we started publishing our talks from the past as uh, an audio only format. You can get access to our YouTube channel, find information about our social media channels, our Discord server, and you will find also a link to maybe get some merch, get a t-shirt with the logo. Ah, what else did I want to mention? Did I mention QED is happening soon? There are still tickets available, so if you can make it to Manchester, you're still in with a chance. About tonight. We will have a talk about 40, 45 minutes, after which we will have a break of 15 minutes time, and then we'll have a question and answer session. If you want to submit your questions, or if you want to see submitted questions and maybe pick the ones you're most interested in, please go to our website, sitp.online forward slash ask. I'm almost out of subject, but I'm pretty sure you know what I want to mention one final time. QED is coming up, so we're all looking forward to that. We also have one ticket that for QED that we wanted to give away as a raffle. Um, we will do that after the break, before the Q&A. So if you participated, Make sure to connect them to find out whether you've won the ticket. Now, about our speaker tonight. Please welcome Professor Sarian Sumner. Normally, when I prepare for, those, for these events and I try to find something interesting to say about our speakers, um, I look up various resources. This time, I was quite happy to find out that Sarian has got a Wikipedia page. But when I looked at the page, I got worried. There are so many Welsh names and places mentioned in there that I got scared for a moment. But then I decided, oh, I'll stick with my usual policy of only mangling one foreign language per event. So I'll stick to English for tonight. About Sarin, she's a professor of behavioral ecology at University College London and studies social insects to understand behavior, ecology, evolution, and their role in ecosystems. 
as she says herself, she is especially fond of wasps. What I would call the insect that normally must not be named. But she is a big fan, so she's putting on quite a PR push for them. For example, 2017, she initiated the Big Wasp Survey, which is a citizen science project to engage with the public with social wasps in their backyard. And she's written a book. It's called Endless Forms, The Secret World of Wasps. And I'm pretty sure that the link to buy this book will be shared by our moderators in the chat repeatedly throughout the night. I think that's enough of an introduction. So please welcome Professor Sarian Sumner. Let's talk about wasps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, so it's really a great pleasure to be here talking to my computer screen and hoping that there are people out there actually listening. Um, so I am here to um, talk to you about wasps and as was shared in the introduction, I kind of like wasps and I also kind of know that you probably don't. Although the fact that you turned up today hopefully means that you're a little bit inquisitive about it. So what I'd like to do before we start is a little bit of audience participation. Um, hopefully you've seen the Mentimeter um, code and QR code on the screen in front of you. If you'd like to follow that link and uh, put your words about the first words that spring to mind when you think about wasps. OK, just whatever that gut feeling is. Don't worry, it's all it's all anonymous. So, you know, just put your words out there. I think you can put at least 10 words each. Um, so put your words up there. Um, and while I give you a, a little bit of background into uh, into who I am. So um, I am indeed from Wales. I didn't realise, uh, I didn't write my Wikipedia page, so I don't know who, who did, it just appeared, but I didn't realise there's so many Welsh names on there. But actually, um, one of the reasons I wrote uh, this book, um, and I, I feel sort of quite passionate about it, is because um, one of the famous writers from Wales, Dylan Thomas, said in his um, Child's Christmas in Wales um, about uh, presents that they're given at Christmas that have no real purpose, including books that tell me everything about wasps except for why. And I wanted to, I thought that really summed up the reasons that people feel about wasps like, why? What's the point of wasps? Why should I care about them? Why should they matter? Why do they exist? And so I'm hoping that um, my book and also this talk will really convince you um, about the why of wasps. So when we talk about wasps, you're probably thinking of these creatures. These are the yellow jacket wasps, um, Vespula wasps to anyone who knows their insects out there. And they are probably bothering, they probably bothered you Maybe not quite so much now because it's getting towards autumn, into the middle of autumn now, but they probably bothered you at your picnics in the summer. And they are well known as being the pest that arrives at the beer gardens, which is very appropriate given that we are, you know, in the pubs, the, 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 the online pub, the skeptics in the pub. So these wasps visit you at your picnic and you end up sorting them away and, and they often ruin your picnic or your, your evening at the beer garden. And unfortunately, it is these wasps that have given um, the general world of wasps an incredibly bad reputation. You might even have had a nest like these ones here in your shed or your loft. You'll recognise this kind of papery football that you will have come across. Now, it's due to these insects that wasps have got a bad reputation. Indeed, they are the gangsters of the insect world. At least that's what the uh, internet and the, uh, the the sort of the insect propaganda that's used to uh, describe wasps. No one really likes wasps. And, and yet it's just this one species or this group of species that bother you at picnics that have given them this kind of macabre, um, annoying, hated name. And that's kind of unfair because there are only about 50 species of these picnic bothering wasps. And if there are only a couple of in, in the UK, there'll be two species that bother you at picnics. The rest won't bother you at all. Um, but in fact, there are over 1500 species of social wasps. And the, the top right hand corner here is the, 
Vespula, the yellow jacket wasp. Below it is the hornet. But the other wasps to the left hand side depict some of the huge diversity, the endless forms of these social wasps that we find around the world. And I'm going to be talking about some of these over the next uh, few minutes. So how did I get into studying wasps? Well, I like you, probably like you, didn't actually like wasps. Um, before I started studying them. In fact, I was probably the first person to swat them and, fly, and run away from them at a picnic. And I wasn't even into insects, but I was into animal behavior. And when I was offered the chance to study animal behavior for a PhD, I jumped at it, despite the fact that it was the behavior of wasps. Um, and it was only a few months into my PhD that I found myself in this situation, sitting, in drainage ditches in the rainforests of South, Southeast Asia, watching wasps. And here I am, and above me, you can see little brown stick-like things. Each one of those is a wasp nest. And on those brown sticks, you'll see some dark brown blobs. Each one of those blobs is a wasp. So above my head are hundreds, if not thousands, of wasp nests. <laughs> And, and if I'd known at the beginning of my PhD that I would be sitting in drainage tunnels in close proximity to thousands of wasp nests, I probably wouldn't have taken the PhD place at all. <laughs> but as it happens, you know, I was persuaded that these were the wasps that mattered. These are the wasps that would be easy to study. They didn't really sting. So my supervisor told me. And in fact, they are essentially they are like the meerkats of the insect world. So everybody loves a meerkat. You've all seen them, seen them on um, your David Attenborough natural history programs. They live in a society and um, some of them will look after the, the offspring. Some of them will be the, uh, the breeders. Some of them will be the, the lookouts, the sentries for predators. Um, and others will go out to do the shopping, to do the foraging. Well, that division of labour is exactly the same as we see in these simple societies of wasps that live in very small groups of up to 10 individuals. And each individual in these nests is able to become a reproductive, and yet only one does, and the rest of them act as helpers. And so these insects are the key to understanding the evolution of altruism, that is giving up the chance to reproduce in order to help raise the brood of others namely your relative. And so I was studying these insects in order to understand how this division of labour could arise. And it was by watching these insects and marking each one individually with paint marks that I grew to absolutely love them. And I realised that they were like a little soap opera and you get really attached to different individuals. And when you had to remove some or behead them in order to do some experiments on them, it did hurt because it alters the whole society. So uh, the whole um, dynamics of the society. But um, my PhD supervisor was not right. They do sting because they're a hunting wasp. Of course they sting. But as described by the crazy American um, biologist, Justin Schmidt, who had made a career for himself of getting himself stung by different insects and then putting them on a scale of how painful they was. These wasps, these Southeast Asian hover wasps, as they're known, are very much ranked at the bottom of the scale. And he describes their sting as like a fragrant tickle. And I've been stung by them a little bit. And I kind of agree with him. It is a little bit like a fragrant tickle. So not all wasps have hideous stings that are going to uh, cause us great pain. And yet, a few years ago, um, some colleagues and I asked the public online to give us some words to describe wasps, just like I've done at the beginning of this talk. And on the left hand side of this slide, you can see the words that people use to describe wasps. On the right hand side are the words they use to describe bees. The size of the word indicates the number of people who use those words. So the bigger the word, the more people use that word to describe that insect. And you can see on the right hand side that bees are generally described in terms of their utility, honey, pollination, um, 
flowers, pollen. Um, there's also words like endangered and pretty and yellow and lovely, very emotive words and, and summing up the usefulness by which bees are, are regarded. Wasps, on the other hand, there was pretty much one word that almost everyone used, and that was the sting. <laughs> so this kind of sums up how people feel about wasps, that we just think about them in terms of their sting. And yet not all of them have particularly bad stings, and they are actually no more likely to sting us than, than many types of bees. But nonetheless, wasps are much maligned, and we have this deep-rooted cultural hatred of wasps, which goes back millennia. In fact, in the Bible, God sends uh, wasps, or hornets in this case, um, which is a particular kind of wasps, to, to punish the unbelievers in at least four books in the Bible. And, and a Senegalese um, a story of creation also describes how a wasp, like this uh, mud dauber wasp on the left here, was um, uh, the one that defied God. So when God was creating the world, so this, uh, this Senegalese story goes, he asked all the animals to look away uh, whilst he continued his creation. And all of, the wasp, all, of the ins all of the animals looked away except for the wasp, who peeked between her, her, her fingers and saw what God was doing. So she defied God. And as punishment, he plucked her around her waist such that she could not rear brood, not rear offspring, not give like, birth to live young. And um, and actually, that story has a lot to say because what the story says that, that the wasp instead could no longer bear young and so would pick up a grub from the ground and put it in her pot. And then somehow, magically, it would emerge as a wasp. So they were partly on the way to describing what the solitary wasp does, because indeed these wasps build a pot, they lay an egg in it, so they do give birth. <laughs> and then the egg will hatch into a larva, which of course is the grub that people will have seen. And then it emerges as an adult wasp. So this hatred of wasp, and yet their curiosity with their life history is deeply rooted in our culture. And despite this being these stories being over 2000 years old, uh, our dislike of wasps has not changed. And I've made it my mission over the last few um, years, really, to try and change people's perceptions about wasps. And I've gone to great extents of giving talks in village halls to dressing up in various types of pseudo wasp like costumes, prancing around on stage, talking to children, getting them to make face masks. And of course, now my book, hoping it'll reach a wider audience than I could with just one village hall or one stage at a time. Um, and one of the first people to write about wasps was actually the first published entomologist. And this was Aristotle. And in his Historia Animalia, he wrote about wasps in uh, four books. And actually, astonishingly, what he writes about wasps, although it wasn't very much, it remains largely true today. He had a really good appreciation of their natural history and of their life cycle. And in fact, in many ways, he got what he wrote about wasps was in some ways more correct than what he wrote about his much beloved honeybees. And given that most of his work was preoccupied by, by bees and humans, this is quite, um, quite a claim to fame. The wasps that he talked about, of course, were the yellow jackets, your picnic botherer wasp, your beer garden bothering wasp. Um, and he had his students at the Lyceum keep these insects in hives as they did honeybees, such that they could observe the structure of the colonies. And you can see the inside of a nest here on the right hand side. These are the different layers of the nest inside. So just like a honeybee nest, these Vespula wasps have combs in which they rear brood and each cell is perfect, is a perfect hexagon. Um, the queen founds a nest on her own. So here at the bottom in the middle here is a picture of a founding queen. And she'll be doing that in spring. And she'll lay the first eggs and rear the first brood. So she lives the life. Her first life is on her own. So she's not a social organism at that moment. And then she, once her first offspring emerge, she won't leave the nest again. She'll stay at home rearing her, um, she'll stay at home being an egg laying machine. 
and the workers who are her offspring, her daughters, will take over the role of foraging. They'll forage for um, meat, so prey to bring back to the nest to feed to the brood, their siblings. But they'll also forage for paper. And you may have seen them on your garden fences and your sheds um, or your garden tables in the summer where they're scraping off the wood from your from the from the fence or the the table and you can even see streaks in your table and your on your shed and what they do is they chew that up with some uh, saliva and they'll form it into the most incredibly um, diverse and strong and versatile paper and in fact we think that probably we have wasps to thank for the fact that we learned how to make paper. So the story goes that a Chinese eunuch was watching wasps, not quite these ones, but a different kind of wasp, uh, taking bark off a tree, and she would, uh, and then he watched her smooth it out into a cell and put it on her nest. And supposedly he thought, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. And there is born, therein was born paper. And where would we be as a human um, culture without the or- without the origins of paper? But wasps have taken paper to a whole new level. And you can see this just within the nest of your picnic bothering yellow jacket wasp. So this picture here, the big nest in front of you with the combs, there are at least three or four different types of paper there. On the outside is the envelope. And that's a very, um, uh, it's a paper of very low density and it's quite brittle, but they have many layers and it serves to insulate the nest, either keeping it warm or cold. Inside the nest, you have the combs and the comb cells themselves are much higher density. They have to be really high density, and but also very uh, to make them very strong and yet light. And these combs, when they're full of brood, are really heavy. The combs are then joined together with pedicles, which are another type of paper altogether. And if you have the joy of getting your hands on an old nest, perhaps from your loft or your shed, do take it apart, explore the different types of paper and see if you can pull those combs apart because you'll find those pedicles incredibly bendy. You simply cannot break it. It's so very strong. Now, the types of wasps that I've been studying a lot of are these much more simple societies. So moving on from the fragrant tickle of the uh, South, uh, South Central um, Southeast Asian hover wasps, I then work, moved on to work on these Polistes paper wasps, which have whopping stings, I have to say. I think they're much higher up on the Schmidt pain scale for his insects. And this is what I, I've spent a lot of my time doing. And this is how I really fell in love with the soap opera of wasps. We mark each wasp individually when she emerges from her cell. And we follow her through her entire life and we can watch who we can work out from their individual numbers who the boss is so who the queen is and who the lowest ranked foragers are and they have a hierarchy we can then play god with these wasps we can remove different individuals on this nest i've removed the queen and they are starting to fight over who is going to be, become the next queen. And you can see the array of um, interactions that are going on here. So if you watch, um, number 74 is now biting number 65. Number 52 is beating up blue, red, yellow. It's like a soap opera of the best order and utterly um, gripping and and. It, you can't tear your eyes off them. You're trying to work out. These fights can go on for weeks. So understanding the uh, succession to the throne and what kind, what the age of the wasp is and why those the wasp that becomes the new queen can tell us a lot about the uh, what makes the social the societies tick. But despite having studied wasps for more than twenty years, I, social wasps for more than twenty years, I realised that in the many conversations I'd had with members of the public, like you guys, that. There is more to life than being social. It's not just the incredible social lives of these insects. Despite the Vespula wasp, the picnic bother has been the, the honeybee of the, of the wasp world, being as incredible as the honeybee. I get it that not everyone is blown away by their sociality. And in fact, that's a good job because there are over 100,000 different species of wasps. So the solitary wasps represent a very small proportion of these. Um, they are so varied and endless in their forms. They are There are parasitoid wasps, which actually 70% of wasps 
are parasitoid wasps and they don't actually have stings. They have an ovipositor, which is an egg laying sheath. And in fact, the sting is a modified ovipositor. So what the stinging wasps, the hunting wasps, evolved from a parasitic wasp ancestor. And on this screen in front of you, you can see the diversity, the colours, the shapes, the forms, the sizes, the phenomenal endless forms that wasps provide us with. And yet wasps remain massively understudied. Um, there are at least four times more research papers on bees or ants than there are on wasps. They are overlooked by scientists and overlooked by the public in, in, in terms of their value and their interest. But it wasn't always like this. In fact, some of the most incredible stories of wasps had come from the early 1900s or the late 1800s, when it was fashionable and respectable to be a naturalist, a gentleman or a gentlewoman naturalist who would spend their time observing wasps. And some of my, I like to call them the wasp whisperers because they've written some beautiful texts that go unrivaled today in terms of the descriptions of the solitary wasp. One of my favorite couples are George and Elizabeth Peckham, who lived in America and in Wisconsin. And they describe with great flourish about their studies of these wasps. And actually, they had a very important role. They were great disciples of Darwin. And they had a very important role in introducing evolution into the school curriculum in, the, in America in the early 1900s. But I just love the way that they describe. I've picked some text out from their book here on wasps, solitary and social from 1905. We ran. We threw ourselves upon the ground. We stumbled, we scrambled along on our hands and knees in our desperate endeavours to keep them in view, sometimes with our eyes upon the wasps themselves and sometimes in pursuit of their shadows, and yet they escaped us. The wasps that they were watching were these. These are solitary digger wasps of the genus Ammophila, and we find them in the UK. They're found in uh, the heathlands of Dorset and um, various other heathlands in southern um, England and on the continent. And they are absolutely gripping to watch. They're solitary. They will hunt a caterpillar. And they describe, the Peckhams describe with enormous detail about the process by which these wasps sting and paralyse their prey. For as a parasitic, as, as a solitary wasp, you don't want to kill your prey, you want to paralyze it. So it's just a suppliant, suppliant, um, compliant uh, bag of nutrition that isn't dead. It's like a living larder. And they'll take their paralyzed prey to an underground burrow where they'll put it in there, lay an egg on it and then seal it up and leave it forever. So the process by which these solitary wasps um, handle their prey is absolutely honed by evolution, such that the wasps deliver the right kind of venom to the right part of the uh, of the prey, and uh, such that it will keep it fresh and alive as a living larder for their growing offspring. My other favourite wasp whisperer is the Frenchman Jean Henry Faber, and he wrote um, many essays about wasps, which, when translated into English, were termed the hunting wasps. And then there was a sequel, um, uh, in ingeniously named More Hunting Wasps. Uh, and they are fantastic read. They are absolutely hilarious. He's a very emotional, you can imagine the flamboyancy of him. He's just incredible. You can imagine his throwing his arms around in despair and in, in amazement. Um, and some of the things that had some of the observations he had remain true today. So he studied these bee wolves. So on the right hand side of this slide, you can see two insects. The top one is the wasp. And that's called a bee wolf or philanthus. And below her, carried like the undercarriage of a plane, is a bee. And she has caught this bee and she has paralysed it with her sting. And she's going to take it to her, her underground uh, chamber. And then she's going to do even more marvellous things with it. So she's paralysed it, not killed it. Um, and these are things that Jean Henry took great, great care to observe in his bell chamber observation um, uh, chamber that you can see in the picture. So when the bee wolf gets her bee to her burrow, she will embalm it. She licks it all over, forming a waterproof covering. She will then put it in the, in the cell. And using her antenna, from her antenna, she will exude a bacteria, 
streptomyces. Streptomyces produces streptomycin, which is the second most important antibiotic that we use to keep ourselves healthy and to combat disease. So this wasp is putting antibiotics into the capsule that she's made. So the, the embalming keeps the fungi out and the bacteria keep it bacteria free. But then the icing on the cake is that the egg, when she lays her egg in there, the egg produces toxic farts of nitrous oxide, which of course is a fungicide that we use to keep our fruit free of fungi. So she, the, the eggs give off this toxic fart, which keeps the fungal levels low until the egg has hatched into a larva, and then the larva can dutifully spread the antibiotic around its chamber. And that's how the bee wolf keeps its prey it keeps its prey free of disease and ensures that its baby who it seals up and says goodbye to and never sees again there's no parental care ensures its baby can live can grow up in a safe clean disease free environment i think that's absolutely incredible it just blows my mind and if it doesn't blow your mind i i don't i honestly don't know actually i do know what might do here's another few things that might blow your mind so the top left hand corner here we've got the jewel wasp which is famous for being the zombie fire um so it it's its prey are the cockroaches and it delivers two very precise stings one is to the thorax of the cockroach, and bearing in mind the cockroach is much bigger than the wasp itself. So it has to be pretty clever about this. So the first sting will immobilise the, uh, the cockroach. And the second sting with this immobilised cockroach enables the wasp to get a very precise sting into the brain, where it delivers a neurotoxin, which um, paralyses the, 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 the cockroach in just the right way that it can still walk, but it has no, it, it can't, it has no will, <laughs> it has no free will. And so the jewel wasp then takes it by its antenna and walks the poor zombified cockroach to its underground tomb where she then lays an egg on it and, and so on in the same way as the bee wolf. I think that's amazing. I, I could go on for hours. There are so many phenomenal stories and each solitary wasp has a different story to tell. There's the, the spider hunting wasps are phenomenal at the far left hand side here. They hunt enormous tarantula spiders and you have to have a whopping venom to be able to paralyze a big spider like that. Um, the other thing, that is really amazing about wasps, of course, is their sting. And as I said earlier, wasp stings evolved from an ovipositor. Now, the original wasp was actually a vegetarian. It was a sawfly or horntail or wood wasp, it's sometimes known as. And these wasps in the far left-hand, top left-hand corner here, these wasps laid their eggs in plants. And in fact, you still find them today. And they're, they're their ovipositor is often serrated such that it can get through the bark in order to lay an egg inside a plant. Um, and the parasitoid wasps evolved from a saw-like, saw wasp, uh, sawfly-like ancestor, and they modified the ovipositor by having, uh, by teaming it with a very thin waist. So when the parasitoid wasps evolved, they had this very thin waist, which meant that they could get their ovipositor into even more difficult places. And that's when they were, became able to, uh, to find prey. And the, um, the diversification of the parasitoid wasps must surely be something to do with the enormous um, mobility and uh, that their wasp waste gave them. So that was the origin of the wasp waste. And then the ovipositor was modified into a sting, which in the hunting wasps is used to paralyze prey. But in our much unbeloved picnic wasp, in the social wasps, these are used purely in defense, only occasionally a hunting. But if the evolutionary stories of wasps don't quite sweep you away, then I'd like you to take this home with you. Without wasps, there would be no bees. We all love bees. There would be no bees. There would be no ants. The reason for this is that ants and bees both evolved from a wasp-like ancestor. Bees are simply wasps that have forgotten how to hunt and ants are simply wasps that have forgotten how to fly or at least only the sexuals can fly. The workers can't fly at all. So I think that's an important thing to remember and if anyone doubts the reason for wasps existence then in evolutionary terms where would we be without them we'd have no bees and no ants 
So sociality, I thought was enough to win over the world to love wasps, but I was proven wrong. And then I thought maybe natural history, the phenomenal stories that I've just told you, maybe that's enough to make people love wasps. But I'm not sure it's still buying it. I'm not sure it's winning the crowds. Natural history alone is not enough. And the reason I know this is coming back to this study where we asked people about their perceptions of wasps. In the same study, we asked people to rate how important they thought wasps and bees were in the environment. And we asked them to rate two different functions, pollination and predation. Now, on this graph, I'm showing you the, the, the data that we got from over 700 members of the public in telling us how useful they thought bees, which is in red. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's on the right hand side of that figure and wasps on the left hand side of the figure. And they rated them between zero and 10. So zero means that they think this insect is useless in, for pollination. And 10 means they think that this is the most essential insect for pollination that ever lived. And pleasingly, the public clearly have a really good understanding of what bees do in the environment because almost everyone ranked what uh, gave wasps, uh, gave bees very high scores for their pollination. Wasps, on the other hand, people were, it's like a random scatter. People gave all sorts of ratings and nobody really knew what they were, what they were doing. When the same question about predation was asked, uh, we got another uh, good response for bees. So the public understand that bees are not important for predation because they gave them very low scores of around zero to two. And that means that people understand that bees are not predators, they're vegetarians, they're not carnivores. Wasps, on the other hand, if people had understood that wasps are important pest controllers, important in predation, then they would look like this bee graph here. They would all be um, clustered up at the H10 area here. So what this told us is that people don't understand what wasps do in the environment. The public have a really good understanding of what bees do, but not wasps. And perhaps that is explains why we forgive bees for the occasional sting and we appreciate them and we take care of them and we plant bee flowers in our got bee friendly flowers in our garden. And if a bee is stuck in your kitchen, you'd carefully help her out. Whereas if a wasp is stuck in your kitchen, you get the air, the wasp raid out or you swat it, don't you? So We've got a job to do because wasps are actually really important in the environment and we need to get the word out about how important they are. So first up, wasps are really important as pollinators. And there are two stories, at least one of which I am sure you already know about. Wasps are, import, are essential pollinators for figs. Exactly. There'd be no figgy pudding without figs. Figs and wasps have a, a very long co-evolutionary story to tell. The wasps depend entirely on the figs and the figs depend entirely on the wasps for their life cycle. They can't live without, without the other. And there are over 800 species of fig wasps, which are largely, not completely, but largely faithful to their species of fig that they, they are essential for the pollination of. The other pollination story, which is well studied and well known, is the story of the orchids. Um, the orchid wasps, or the thinidae, are, are fooled by the plant. So this is quite a different story. It's not, co it's not um, a mutualism. The wasp doesn't actually benefit from the orchid at all. The orchid has evolved to manipulate the behaviour of the wasp. The orchid has evolved to look and smell and even feel like a sexy female wasp, such that the male wasp can't help himself but be lured into this trap, attempt to mate with what he thinks is a really sexy wasp, but actually it's just the flower. And in doing so, a dollop of pollen gets deposited on his back. And then of course he goes off to the next sexy looking female, which is another orchid flower, and therein he has done his pollination job. So that's a fantastic story as well. Two essential roles of wasps as pollinators. But what about the rest of the wasps? Well, actually, probably all wasps are doing some form of important pollination. Um, 
In this picture here, we have a, a Vespula wasp, which I actually took this photo this afternoon in my garden. This is a, a picnic bothering wasp on some ivy. This is a pompylid wasp, a spider hunting wasp on, on a plant. And then another um, hornet here on, on some what looks like maybe ivy as well. And these are all wasps that are visiting the plants in order to get nectar. And they need nectar because although wasps are meat eaters, the adults themselves are actually vegetarians. They hunt the prey, um, paralyze it either to lay their eggs on it or they in the social wasp, they'll kill it to feed to brood back at the nest. But the adults themselves get very little nutrition from those um, from the prey itself. And so they have to get nutrition from somewhere and they get it from flowers. And actually, the records of wasps on flowers shows that they are incredibly diverse in the types of flowers that they visit. Uh, we recorded over 850 different species of flowers visited by these wasps. And they appear to be very much a generalist wasp visitors. And some scientists think that because of their generalism, they are likely to be important backup pollinators to bees. So in, in environments that are very degraded by us, like urban environments, for example, um, where there isn't a good floral resource, um, the, uh, or the floral resources are not, are not good enough to support a good bee population, the wasps move in to help pollinate. And there is actually a study that showed that in the absence of bumblebees, Polistes paper wasps were able to completely uh, replace the pollination services of those bees. So there is evidence to show that wasps are effective and important pollinators. But of course, let's come back to their role as predators. Wasps are nature's pest controllers. They help regulate the populations of insects and arthropods, that some of which we probably hate as much as we do wasps, or at least find annoying. And we might be using chemicals to help control, like aphids on your tomato plants, caterpillars on your lettuces, spiders. I often say to people, if there's an organism that you hate more than wasps, it might be spiders. Wasps hunt spiders. They're doing you a service and getting rid of those spiders. Um, and the array of species that wasps hunt is utterly mind blowing, especially your picnic bothering wasp, who actually is a generalist. They will, she will hunt anything that's available, anything that's abundant, including carrion. So they're important in decomposing as well as eating fresh prey. So that's why they visit you at your picnic um, and have a little munch of your sausage if you allow her. So this brings into focus the role of wasps not only in natural ecosystems as regulators of insect populations, but also the potential role or the actual role that they're playing in a crop as crop pet, a crop um, as predators of crop pests. And in fact, because many of the crop, the main crop pests that we have around the world are caterpillars and flies. And these are the things that wasps will happily eat. Now, the idea that wasps could be important as uh, pest control is not a new idea. Um, over 150 years ago, uh, Edward uh, Omrod wrote this lovely book, British Social Wasps, which is now out of print, like all the wasp books. Um, and he says in this book, the practical result of destroying all of the wasps on Sir Brisbane's estate was that in two years time, the place was infested like Egypt with a plague of flies. So what that means is that when they took all the wasps away, the fly populations exploded. So I think this is probably the oldest um, evidence of an experimental proof that wasps are really important as pest controllers. And it's quite astonishing, therefore, that there is so little research into the role of wasps as predators and pest controllers. In our lab in UCL, we're doing some work now to look at the potential that wasps hold as natural enemies of pests, particularly in developing countries like Africa and, and South America, where the diversity of social wasps is huge. They are often found nesting in um, 
uh, uh, people's houses on on farms on outbuildings on abandoned buildings so they adapt they adapt they appear to adapt very well to surviving this kind of anthropogenic change in the environment that we are creating and their main uh, prey is mostly lepidopteran so caterpillars which is one of the main economic pests and so we're doing some work now looking at the um the role of these wasps in helping control um key economic pests like the fall army worm and the sugarcane borer in these countries. I think the power of harnessing the predatory um, possibilities of wasps, we have only just scratched the, the tip of the iceberg, but they provide, they could potentially provide an important contribution to some sort of integrated pest management program, which means that farmers can rely much less on harmful chemicals and more on the natural enemies that nature provides us with. So what more can wasps do for you? Well, there are many more stories. I'm just going to mention uh, just a few, uh, just a very small number more. I mentioned about the uh, the wasp venom having to be really very bespoke to be able to paralyze the particular kind of prey in a particular way. And this is so important for those wasps. And so it's been honed carefully by evolution. And in fact, the venom of wasps is a veritable untapped medicine cabinet. In the venom of wasps, scientists have found antibacterial properties, antiviral properties, and even a potential cure for cancer. Another fabulous story is a story about the antibiotics and or the, the, the way that, organism, that wasps can alter the materials that they work with. So on the right hand side here is a mud daubing wasp from, um, uh, from Africa. And these wasps introduce minerals into the clay of their nests. And these minerals are things like zinc and iron um, and magnesium, which are, of course, minerals that are really important for our health. And in parts of rural Africa, anthropologists have observed that pregnant women and children will pluck the pots off the net, off their huts, the walls of their huts and eat them because, of course, they, 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 they contain all of these essential minerals that people like us in the West will probably just go to the pharmacy to buy instead. Wasps are also an important source of human nutrition. Um, particularly popular they are in Asia, where there are over 2 billion people around the world who eat insects. In fact, we should all be eating insects. Entomophagy is, I think, something that we should all be embracing. So we have mealworms that we put on our, our risotto. We've just had some, actually. Um, and this picture here at the bottom here on the orange box are some wasps that I took in my kitchen, a picture earlier in my kitchen. Uh, we had a visitor from Japan just last week who is... Um, actively involved with promoting the eating of wasps in Japan. And on the left hand side here is a picture of a Japanese family who've collected a Vespula wasp colony from the forest, reared it over the summer like you would possibly look after a honeybee colony. And then at the end of the summer, they're harvesting. The, so the big things that like dinner plates with the swirls on them, those are combs from a wasp nest. Um, and they're picking out the larvae, which you can see on the plates. The Japanese uh, such as their um, appreciation of wasps as a source of nutrition, they have wasp festivals. They have wasp competitions uh, where people will compete to see who has the biggest, heaviest wasp nest because they, they really absolutely love eating these things. And actually hot off the press is um, a company um, in I think Devon, who have just um, produced this beer, which is made with wasp yeast. Um, there are some, there is this, um, uh, the scientists in Italy have identified that the uh, that brewer's yeast overwinter in the abdomens of wasps in uh, in Italy. And that this is that then they, then when the wasps come out of ha hibernation, they will then go out and the, and the yeast will be spread. And that's a way, so basically wasps are helping look after brewer's yeast. So if you care about beer, um, if you care about wine, um, wasps are potentially um, a, a contrib contributor here. And as far as I'm aware, this is the first um, wasp yeast made beer, at least in the UK anyway. Okay. I'm almost at the end, and I'd like you now to think, what would a world without wasps be like? And you may have heard this quotation that is probably not come from Einstein, but it's always attributed to Einstein that if bees disappeared, we would only have 
four years left on this planet for humans to survive because we depend so much on the ecosystem services of bees. Can we say the same about wasps? Well, actually, we don't have anything like the research base to be able to put a proper value, an economic value, an ecological value on wasps. Most of what I presented to you at the moment is qualitative information. We don't we can put a, a, a number on the uh, economic value of bees. There were three hundred and fifty billion dollars a year um, and we can't do the same for wasps so we don't actually know what a wasp a world without wasps would look like it would most certainly have a lot more of other insects possibly ones that you hate more than wasps so you would end up missing the wasps but i'd like to end with this rather sad story on our impact on wasps this is a mud dauber wasp from south america she lives in the city and she collects clay and builds it into uh, clay cells, which you can see on the right hand side of this figure here. And you can even see a pupa, the two ends of this pot of the of the you can see three cells and the two end ones have got a developed pupa. And in fact, there's a wasp just emerging on the right hand side one. So she's built these clay cells and she's put provisioned them with um uh, prey, so probably spiders, and then she's laid an egg in each cell, and then she's sealed it up and off she's gone. Now, when she built this nest, she uh, used some light coloured clay. Um, you can see it around the outside. It's the grey stuff. And it was very soft and, and, and compliant when she when she made her nest. So it felt just right. But actually, the we in the weeks that it took for the brood to develop, that clay has hardened. And when the wasp was trying to, when the wasp babies have emerged as adults and they're trying to bite their way out, bite their way out of the cells, they can't get out. And the reason is that that, that grey clay is concrete. So effectively, that mother wasp has sealed her brood in a death chamber with concrete which I think is extremely sad. Um, but of course, these wasps are just responding to the same cues that they evolved to respond to. They're looking for a clay of the right consistency. And it just so happens that concrete, when not when before it's hardened, res resembles the same kind of clay consistency that they have evolved to respond to. So this is like an ecological trap that the Anthropocene, the changes in the ra rapidly changing environment that we're causing, is having an impact. So I think it's a very sad story. I actually cried when I first read this paper. OK, on a, on a more bright note, I'd like to end. Um, you can read more about some of the stories and more in my book, Endless Forms, The Secret World of Wasps, which is available from all good booksellers. Um, and, but I'd like you to take a moment now to um, go to this second Mentimeter code, which is a different one, and now share the words about your wasps that you think of now after my talk. And I'd like to know what you think, whether it's changed your opinion or not. So I'll just leave that up there for a minute um, so you can um, put your words in. Um, actually, maybe we should take the words, um, I can show the results after the break, maybe? What do you think? I can that see our like idea. idea. Yeah? Okay, in that case, I will sign off and I will say thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to hearing your questions um, uh, very shortly. Thank, thank you very you. much. That was fantastic. I know there was a lot of discussion ongoing in the Twitch channel, and there's a lot of interesting questions already in our Q&A session. So just a reminder, in case you don't know how to put on your own questions, if you go to sitp.online forward slash ask, you can put up your own questions. You can have a look at the questions that are already there and vote those up that you really would like to have answered. We will try to work through as many of them as we can after the break, which will be 15 minutes from now. If you think 15 minutes is a little bit long, I want to remember, remind you that we had a four year break since the last QED conference. So 15 minutes should be fine. So. I shall all see you see you all again at about 10 past 8 UK time. Thank you. Hello, welcome back. 
So I put the results from the Mentimeter of the words that I asked you to use to describe wasps before the talk on the left hand side and after the talk on the right hand side. And I'm really sorry, I, I, I accidentally limited the number of words on the, uh, the after, so I didn't mean to do that. So I've put the, um, the Mentimeter codes up again. If you want to add your words, try not to be influenced by what's already there. But I think they already uh, sum up what I what I what I expected. So the before is you've used words like sting and scary and angry. But to be fair, you also have words about them being misunderstood, fascinating and beautiful. So well done. But I do like the fact that the afterwards uh, show that you really bought the idea that wasps are really diverse, that they're pollinators, that they're predators, that they're really interesting and that they're useful, although still a little scary. So we've got a little bit more work to do. But um, this is great. So if you if you can just um, feel like you can add more words into the Mentimeter, that's wonderful because it gives me some feedback on, on what you've what you've uh, taken on and which were the most persuasive parts of my talk in my mission to convert the world to loving wasps. And this is Pebbles, by the way. It's my daughter's rabbit. So I was told to bring a pet. <laughs> it's not a wasp. It's a, it's a cuddly, cuddly rabbit. She's a bit scared though so i might have to let her go in a minute um but yeah so we've got multiple questions that we want to re to handle and uh, we will go through them now uh okay our first question comes from parrot lady and she asks how should we act upon our common wasps to ab around our common wasps to avoid aggression how do we read their body language so that's a really good question um and the answer is very simple. Don't behave like a badger. And I say badger because badgers are the main predators of uh, social wasps, the common wasps um, in Europe. And they, what does a badger do? It digs them up from the ground. And when it digs them up, it's flailing its arms around like this and it's breathing heavily. And so wasps have evolved to be able to defend themselves against these predators. And what do we do at picnics when a wasp's around? We're swatting and we're shouting. <laughs> so we are behaving like badgers. So it's no surprise that they come at us and sting us. So the way to deal with a, pit, with a wasp at when it comes invade your space is just to stay still watch it and see where it's going. And normally it will be going for your, this time of year it'll be going for something sugary. So if you've got jam or a beer or a drink of lemonade or something, they'll probably be going for that. Earlier on in, this, in the season, they'll probably be going for your sausages or your pork chops or your ham. Um, so once you've worked out what the wasp wants, then give it a little offering, put a little bit aside for them, let them have it and they'll go back and forth to that source and they'll leave you alone. Um, I can almost guarantee it. It works a treat. And I have to say, in the UK, we're kind of behind. We're, we're, we're a step behind other people. So in Argentina, where these wasps are an invasive species and they're quite problematic, uh, when Argentinians go out for a picnic or something, they'll take some uh, smelly fish with them and they'll put it as a kind of offering a few uh, metres away. And the wasps okay. will happily feed off that and leave them unbothered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was just going to ask how far aside should we put it? So you say a few meters. But you don't need it very far away at all. I mean, you know, it's as long as it's if you're happy with them just feeding just beside you, then that's absolutely fine. It, it's just a case of they're less likely to find to bother you if it's a bit further away. Okay, based on past experience, is there a version of this advice for little children to understand? Well, I think so. I have a six year old and he's well, uh, well conditioned to just when a picnic, <laughs> when the wasp comes along at the picnic, he just sits like there like this. And even a wasp landed on his face the other day and he just sat there. <laughs> he's terribly well controlled. <laughs> OK, OK. The, the non non wasp specialists will try to teach the children accordingly. OK, we've got another question. Nadia asks for someone who's likely allergic to wasps things. Is there a way to keep them away without harming them? Well, I think it's the same thing, you know, give them a bait. Um, if you really need to keep them away, then you can use wasp traps, which I don't, I'm not advocating, but I mean, we use wasp traps uh, to sample wasps um, in the big wasp survey, which is a citizen science project that we run. And we get people to make, just get a bottle, cut the top off it, invert it and put a bit of beer in the bottom or orange juice or mm. something and then hang it up 
you know, a few metres away from where you're going to be um, hanging out and the wasps will hopefully be attracted there. But it just depends on whether you've got something more attractive on your okay. plate. But I think the other thing to also say is that as soon as you've finished eating, you know, clean up and don't leave bits of food hanging around your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> clean your beard. <laughs> <laughs> wash your hands because if your hands are sticky then they'll come to your fingers right? okay and then that's when you start to panic <laughs> and the worst place to get stung is the finger tip of the finger because you've got such a concentration of nerves there it really hurts <laughs> okay along the same line question from liz do wasps really chase people can they identify and fixate on an individual person and chase after them so wasps have really good vision and there are accounts of people fixating on uh, wasps fixating on particular people and chasing them. Um, we don't really know why they do that, but we do know there are some studies that have shown that wasps can identify a human face, um, mm -hmm. but not when it's upside down. So, okay. you know, where I'm going with this. If a wasp is chasing you, stand on your head. <laughs> And it won't recognise you anymore. No, I don't mean that. It's a joke. Okay. <laughs> um, but they, technically, they they are they do have very good visual um, orientation, and so they can work out their you know that they they can see the different structures of your face, and they do they can identify people. They can recognise one person from another. Why they chase particular people? It's not really very clear. I think it's just rather unfortunate that, that perhaps that person resembles in some way something that they find interesting. Um, but they're often not chasing you to sting you unless you've actually disturbed them. Um, okay. you know, if you're digging up their nest, then they will chase you, yes. But if you're just uh, walking along the street, it's very unlikely that they'll chase you. Okay. Good. I think the perceived threat from wasps is still a large subject, so there's a few more questions about that. <laughs> um, something more lyrical from Igor. Do those wonderful angry murder bullets have something resembling colony collapse disorder like bees do? Or are they immortal, as Deranga suggests? Uh, I'm not sure what murder bullets are. Uh, I think he's talking about wasps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, maybe we need to go revisit that, that terminology. Um, so, no, they don't have colony collapse, uh, as far as we're aware. Um, one of the re colony collapse is, um, is is a term used to describe honeybee colonies, which are appear to be dying around the world. Um, so the colonies are collapsing. But one of the reasons why we think that honeybee colonies are suffering in this way is because of the way that we keep them and the way that we work them. So. Okay. The colonies that suffer most from colony collapse are ones that are heavily um, managed, um, mm -hmm. particularly the, and by managing the bees, you know, opening your beehives, you're exposing them to varroa mites um, and you're stressing them and you're taking honey off. And that's all very unnatural, um, even though bees are honeybees are largely a semi domesticated insect. Um, but, you know, we work our bee, honeybees hard, um, particularly in parts of the world where they're moved around. So they're shipped across countries to fit the seasons to mm -hmm. be pollinators for different um, different crops. So we work them very hard. We've, we're pushing them to their limits. And it's thought to be a combination of stress and disease that is okay. leading to colony collapse. Are there any parasites that could cause a, a wasp colony to, to collapse or die out? There are lots of parasites of wasps. Yeah, I mean, a huge range. So actually, there's a there's a parasite that we have in the UK that attacks our um, common wasp nest, our Vespula mm -hmm. wasp nest, which is, um, in fact, many of your, um, the viewers might might know this. It's Volucella. It's a hoverfly. Um, it's a it's a hornet mimicking hoverfly. Um, okay. so it looks a bit like a hornet. It's quite. <coughs> And the larvae of that um, eat the nest itself. So they eat the sorry, eat the brood in the nest. And so they oh. do. They are a parasite. Um, and in fact, these very parasites are being taken to um, parts of the world where these wasps are invasive and causing huge trouble, like in New Zealand. And they're trying to introduce them as biocontrol agents to help mm -hmm. control the wasp populations there. Um, there are lots of other parasites of wasps. I mean, the number of times I've lost wasp nests, in, um, particularly in the tropics, 
to parasites is I've lost track. You know, there are so many parasitoid wasps that lay mm-hmm. their eggs in, para- in in wasp nests. There are lepidopterans that eat their way through. There are flesh flies that eat their way through the nest. There are a huge number of parasites, as does everything. Have you yeah. know, every every organism has its own set of parasites. Okay, good. Karen Tankeris, who confesses herself to be a big Linnaeus fan, asks the question, given the huge number and variety of species, how is the wasp classified? Uh, well, yeah, wasps, that's a really good question. It's been really hard to classify wasps. There are, with over 100,000 species of them, um, they are quite hard to, to classify. And also, there are probably 10 times as many species of wasps. It's just that they haven't been discovered yet or they haven't been described. Um, particularly, the ver- many of them are very, very small. In fact, the smallest insect is a wasp. It's called the fairy fly, although it's a wasp. Um, okay. a- and they are the- there is there are some good phylogenies, which, which help us classify um understand the evolutionary history and thus the classification of these insects um and basically you've got the saw flies at the bottom and then from them you've got the parasitoid wasps and off that you've got actually ants pop out in the middle there and you've got the the um the solitary wasps and the social wasps and the bees at the top so there is a really good understanding of that but um I've got a passage in my book, actually, where I describe how my grandmother was obsessed with um, buttons and she'd, she, she'd um, classify buttons by shape yeah. and colour and size and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I, I use that as, a, as an example of how she would be horrified at the idea of classifying wasps because it's, <laughs> it's just it's more difficult than the, an infinite button box. OK, <laughs> Good. We've got a question from an anonymous uh, wa- viewer. Are there good good resources for identifying wasps and maybe smaller bees without becoming too expert? We have a mature oak and other trees in the garden and we see all sorts. There's some really good guides. Um, I've got one up here. Um, do you want me to show you? <laughs> I don't know whether you want me to or not. Why this not? book's really good. I, I'm no relation, just it's a really good book. It's got really nice um, pictures of, of wasps in it. So the main okay. wasps. But of course, there are 7,000 species of wasps in the UK alone. This book is really good if you want to um, get into to identifying them, but it does require following a, a key. Um, so it might not be what this uh, uh, um, person is after. There's some really good online resources. Um, and actually, the best place to go is to go to social media. Twitter in particular is great. If you post a picture of a wasp on um, Twitter, I can guarantee that someone will identify it for you. OK, good. Slava Ukraini is asking the next question. If wasps get rid of caterpillars, how can I encourage them to get rid of the ones munching my cabbages? Yeah, so actually what you want is a wasp nest in your garden. (laughs) Um, And it's kind of hard to um, encourage wasp nests in your garden, but if you can um, make your garden um, uh, messy, and in, you know, it's not just the solitary. It's not just the social wasps that will eat your caterpillars. It's also the solitary wasps. So if you just the more natural you can make your garden, the more you can plant um, uh, sort of wildflowers in between your your cabbages, then the more likely you are to have those natural enemies, not only wasps but other things as well, that will hunt the caterpillars in your garden. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Um... Ah, there it is. Next question. Um, I'm not sure I like that name. Gas eruption Chaculator asks, how intelligent are wasps? I saw on YouTube video a hornet that had learned or been trained to open a flap to obtain food. Yeah, wasps are really clever. So we know that bees are really clever. We know they can count. We know they can measure. We know that they can um, uh, learn associations really well. Um, there's not there's hardly any research on the intelligence of wasps, but from the research that is available, we know that they have they're very clever. So what actually one of the earliest um, examples of how clever wasps are is uh, a book by um, uh, Sir John Lubbock, who was Darwin's neighbor. 
and okay. he, <laughs> he did all sorts of crazy experiments in his little you know his his probably wasn't little in his house um and he opened the window and he'd let a wasp or a bee in and he'd put them in a bottle a glass bottle and he would invert the bottle so that the opening of the bottle was facing away from the window um and put a bee in this bottle and the bee could not find its way out it would just keep going towards the light um whereas the wasp immediately found its way out <laughs> so he kind of just suggests that wasps are very clever because they could do that of course that's just a function of their ecology that wasps go to dark places to hunt uh whereas ah. bees will always go to light to find flowers so that's not necessarily a measure of their intelligence um wasps as i say you can identify they can identify people's faces they also use um visual cues to identify each other and there's been some fantastic work by um, a professor in the US Liz Tibbetts where she's looked at how the facial markings on wasps um, are used by the wasps within a society to identify each other and also kind of as like a badge of status um, and so uh, they know that you, they know how what your you know what your rank is based on your the markings and she's manipulated the markings and the wasps change their responses so they're certainly mm -hmm. um, and she's also shown that they um, they have transitive inference, which means that they can make the same kind of um, deducing steps that we can make based on, you know, I know that A is bigger than C and B is bigger than C. And therefore, I know, therefore, from that information, I can tell that A is um, bigger than B. Is that right? Is that right, Rowan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, C and B is bigger than C so C is the smallest and then B but I've not actually been able to compare A and B directly but yeah. because I know that A is bigger than C and B is bigger than C then A also has to be bigger than B it's called transitive inference okay <laughs> yes B, wasps can do that, which is pretty amazing humans can do that and wasps can do it too good Actually, along those lines, we've got a good question from another anonymous viewer. What is the wasp behavior that most surprises you? Um, oh, I don't know. There are so many things. Every every time I look at a wasp, I find something surprising. But I guess the thing that I've studied that's been most surprising, um, a few years ago, we found that wasps, so in a society, a wasp should stay in its own nest and it should help raise the brood of its relatives. Uh, and it lives in a family group. So therefore, mm -hmm. you, it should be staying at home and helping because that way it passes on more of its gene variants because its relatives carry its own gene variants and so it shouldn't be helping on another nest and yet we were in panama we were marking these wasps and the ones that video i showed you and they were being found on the wrong nest all the time and i genuinely thought we were just being really sloppy uh, really bad at our field work but then i got these little radio tags and put them on the wasps and in order to automatically record where the wasps were and yeah. lo and behold 50 percent of the wasps were spending time on other nests and that was really surprising and we've done a lot of research on that since and we've worked out that actually they help they're helping on multiple different nests that they're related to so it's kind of got this extended family network across many many nests so that was pretty surprising i agree that's pretty good Okay, clio has got a question. Um, I think we're talking about the zombifying wasps now. Are their prey still conscious to normal insect consciousness levels when paralyzed? Cleo wants to reserve her opinion about whether she's impressed or not. <laughs> uh, well, the, the venom contains neurotoxins. And given that the brain is the epicenter of of the you know the functioning of the nervous system in an insect, uh, they probably aren't whatever you call insect consciousness is probably not. <laughs> okay. They're effectively in a coma. Oh, okay, but they still can move on their own. No, somehow. not normally. It's the it's only the, uh, the 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 cockroach one is the only one that can really move. Okay. Okay. Good. Anonymous question. Do you have any unfortunate lab accident stories? Um, well, uh, lab, uh, I guess field stories. I've got so many field stories. Um, so well, coming back to the predators and pests of, of wasps, the, the, the diseases of wasps and things that eat them, I'd spent months marking every single wasp on 
loads of nests in this site in Panama. And I came along <clears throat> one morning and I watched this bird eating the nests. <laughs> ah. <laughs> might feel that it was gone. And then the a similar thing happened with a PhD student a few years later. Um, we turned up at the field site that he'd been studying for three months. And we turned up just as the army ants were moving in. And you can't do anything about it. And the wasps were sitting off the nest and the army ants were just coming in, plucking out the brood and carrying them off. That was really quite horrendous. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. OK, hopefully we'll have something um, more, more friendlier now. Parrot Lady's got another question. Um, does it have a significant impact when we kill entire wasp nests in gardens or are there enough wasps in nature to cope with this? Uh, I would I would not kill a wasp nest in your garden or in your house unless you unless it presents a health hazard to you. Um, yeah. Often people find uh, only discover that, uh, that they've got a wasp nest uh, right at the end of the summer, yeah. and that's just before it's been there since March, April, May, and it's been there all that time. It's not bothered you. The workers have been busily being your pest controllers in your garden um doing you a service and so i think we have to learn to live well with wasps we have to live learn to live alongside them so unless you have a severe allergic reaction or you've got young children who if they they're going to in, you know end up falling into the nest or something then i would always advocate don't get rid of them okay it's quite interesting i live in cologne germany and here it's actually uh, it's illegal to remove wasp nests oh, you, need, really? you need to get specialists to move them Wow. There are. Is that just the hornets, though? I thought it was the hornets that No, were... I think it's also the, the, the normal yellow jackets. OK, right. That's great. Yeah, you Germans are ahead of the curve. <laughs> OK, good. Skeptical Gumby asked a question. What would happen if all the wasps died out? Yeah, well, as I Which said, was... my thought... Sorry, I want to make sure we, uh, we credit the question correctly. It was out. The, this question was asked on Twitch by uh, Korva Milkman. So, um, OK, uh, as I said in my talk, I don't, we don't really know what would happen if the wasps all died out um, because there's not enough research to know exactly their impact on the environment. But it's very likely that there'll be lots of other populations of insects. Like, you know, if you remove any top predator from a system, um, it yeah. has an impact on the prey and the prey populations would would go up massively. So you would have a lot more pests in your garden. You'd have to use a lot more chemicals probably to kill the caterpillars on your tomato, on your, your lettuces and your cabbages and your aphids. OK, we're getting to the end of the list now. Uh, another, anonym, another anonymous question. Um, are all commercial figs self-fertile? Or are they still fertilized um, by? But most figs don't need wasps. And also, sadly, if the fig wasps died out, we would still have figs because there's such a commercial uh, way of farming them that we don't we don't rely on the figs, on the wasps, okay. sadly. But we would lose that incredible evolutionary history of millions of years of, of phenomenal evolution, which I think would be even more sad than an absence of figs themselves. OK. Now for the nitty gritty, literally, <laughs> Liz has got a question. How do you put the numbers on the wasps when you are studying them? Uh, so you super glue. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we hold, we catch the so we catch a wasp nest in a Ziploc bag. We wear marigold washing up gloves uh, with a bit of gaffer tape around our fingers, and we hold them between our fingers. And then okay. we will either put paint spots on them, or for the numbers, which are the B tag numbers that beekeepers use, we put a blob of super glue and stick the number on top. Okay, I would have expected that you have some way of maybe immobilizing them or yeah, we just like hold you, you them. basically have to catch them like mr miyagi with a pair of sticks yeah so no no it's um it's yeah it's quite it's quite nice it's quite therapeutic painting wasps I reckon it's very mindful <laughs> <laughs> okay warhammer 2000 or whatever those games called. Yeah, exactly. enthusiasts might agree with you okay um last question skeptical gumby is interested where can she actually get the wasp beer Oh, the wasp 
it. Yeah. So I have the bottle here. So very, it's very nice. The lady, the 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 gentleman who runs this company, uh, actually, come. Um, I don't know him. He just contacted me on, on on email a few months ago, and he said that he was trying to um, rear. He was trying to brew beer from the yeast of a, of a wasp and could I help and I couldn't at the time but anyway he got in touch with these people in Italy and they helped him and in the end just the other day this arrived at my office um it is a bottle of the beer I've not opened it yet maybe I will after this talk um it's from the wild beer co company I guess wildbeerco.com um I'm not sure you can buy it yet, okay. but I think it's um, it is available as a big box of other what, beer. I think I'm not I'm no relation. <laughs> I'm not haven't tasted it yet, but I okay. was, I just thought it would be worth mentioning. Um, so yes, yeah, especially given that this is a skeptics in the pub, and if we're in the pub, we'd normally be having a a, a beer, wouldn't we? So uh, yeah, yes, so I do. I, I don't know. I can't recommend it yet, but I love the fact that it's made with. I don't know if you can see it. There's wasp yeast. There. I still wonder how they extract the wasp beast. Well, actually, he tells me that this, I'm giving away his trade secrets now, but he told me that um, this is actually from the nests. Okay. The nest can't, that, and I don't know where he gets it from in the nest, so I've yet to find out, but it's obviously a trade secret, so I should yeah. <laughs> probably giving it all away now. But you can go to his website, wildbeerco.com, um, okay. and I think they're based in Bristol. Good. Excellent. Well... That was the last question. Thank you very much. That was a highly entertaining and very informative talk and questions. So thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. I've got a few last reminders to everybody on the on the stream. Um, there will be a next talk because of QED. We can't stick to our normal schedule for October. So this is the only talk in October we will be having. The next regular Skeptics in the Pub Online talk will be on November 10th. Uh, we're still finalizing details with our speaker and the subject, so please keep an eye out for any updates. But I think it's going to be very interesting from what I've heard behind the scenes. Um, if you miss us, if you miss our streams, don't forget, we will be live streaming Skepticamp, 28th of October, 11 p.m. British summertime, a.m. <laughs> British summertime. We will start, and hopefully some of you will be able to join in. Um, Let's see whether we maybe afterwards also can add those talks to our uh, YouTube channel. Um, other than that, a reminder that our pub will be opening now. So the um, Occam's Razor will open as soon as we're done here. If you want to join us, go to sitp.online forward slash virtual pub. And I think our moderators are also putting the link in the uh, Twitch chat. Other than that, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much again. Therian, for your talk. We really loved it. Everybody online, I hope you're clapping like madmen. Other than that, all I can say, hopefully we will see you in Manchester at QED. And for anybody who can't make it, as usual, I leave you with stay safe, stay healthy, stay skeptical. Good night. <laughs>